So let's look at some examples of that. This is an area called the hippocampus, where you can see these beautiful brain cells. Well, I think they're beautiful. I don't know what the artists think, but I think they're lovely. Stay the same one in ten, showing these lovely long branches. And the reason I'm suddenly mentioning the hippocampus, you may have heard about it on the news several years ago now, is that it featured in an ingenious study of, of all people, London taxi drivers. Now, London taxi drivers, as everyone here knows, has to pass the knowledge. That is to say, you can jump in, and they, they make quite a good fist of this, actually, and you can say, take me from A to B, and usually they can do so without recourse to a manual, and they, and they know the one-way systems. Now, imagine, for a London taxi driver, the burden on what's called their working memory compared to the rest of us. They are, every day of their lives, remembering highly complex information and configurations, spatially. And in this ingenious study by Ellen McGuire, a woman scientist, um, uh, a genius idea. She just scanned the brains of London taxi drivers compared to people of comparable age and found that the hippocampus, this area that's related to memory, was bigger in London taxi drivers than other people. A fact not lost on the London taxi drivers. So <laughs> most of them have heard of this experiment, actually. So next time you take a cab, ask if they had the hippocampus. And uh, you'll, you'll see they all have. Um, and it's not that having a big hippocampus predisposes you to being a London taxi driver, uh, because the difference was more marked for the longer they've been driving. So, um, so now many people probably there are not that many London taxi drivers here, but there I'm sure many people who play the piano or the kids play the piano. Here's another experiment. This one um, involved three groups of adult human volunteers, none of whom could play the piano. None. And for five days, um, they had the experiment. The control group, as always, poor old control group always get the short straw. They had to stare at a piano for five minutes. <laughs> they not do very much. Yeah? Um, the other group had to learn five-finger piano exercises for five days. And the most interesting group was the third group. They had to learn, but imagine they were doing it, not actually play. Now, let's look at the brain scans of these three groups. And here you can see, let's take the controls first. This is over a five-day period. Can you see the black blobs? show that literally in the control group, the brain was literally unimpressed, literally <laughs> unimpressed by staring at yeah, this bit of the brain. However, those learning, you know, look, even after five days, so as you've got kids doing five things piano exercises, what's going on in their heads in over five days? But look at this, this is the most remarkable, is merely imagining you're playing the piano has a similar effect. Thank I gather the same, is with, <laughs> the same is with golf, yeah? And with many other things, I'm sure. That, but the whole idea, is, I'm sure there's some nascent philosophers here, or philosophers here, that, who like to draw a distinction between mental and physical. I, as a neuroscientist, would give you, challenge you with that. My own view is that mental versus physical is not very helpful as a distinction. It's actually downright misleading. You don't have some airy, fairy world that you know, is devoid of the squalor of the kind of world that I live in. But the two do mix very much. And, and one is related very closely to the other. That everything you're feeling and thinking, however seemingly rarefied and exotic, actually has a grounding in the bump and grind of brain cells. Banal though that sounds, as you can see. So the more you practice, the more your brain, like any part of your body, will respond by getting stronger. <coughs> so let's ask the question then, as philosophers would, and neuroscientists very rarely do, what is a mind? Well, I'd like to suggest to you this is the mind. You're born with almost your 100 billion neurons. We've seen that the growth of the connections between the cells accounts for the growth of the brain after birth. For people that like numbers, that's about 150 trillion. These connections, as we've seen, reflect experience. And therefore, it is these connections, look at that lovely picture, where you have brain cells, but more importantly, they're connections that gives you your uniqueness. This is what makes you the person you are. It's not just that you have connections and they're fixed, but they are evolving and changing and updating every second or sub-second you're alive. Every experience you're having is modifying a connection and every experience you're having, you're evaluating in terms of what's happened before. And this iteration, this dialogue, this beautiful dialogue, and exquisite adaptation between you and your environment is the hallmark, it's the birthright of the human brain, par excellence, although other animals do it, par excellence is what we do brilliantly, which is why we are more individual than any other species, I would argue. So, let's look again at the rodents and see what the basis for this is. What is the basis for those increased blobs? Well, here we have again, this time our friends, the rats, in an isolated environment versus, again, a so-called enriched environment. We're going to look at a single brain cell from each of these animals. Okay. Now, at first glance, for the non-specialist, this might seem the same, but look very carefully. The blobby bit is the main part of the cell. What I want you to look at are the branches. 
Remember I pointed out the beautiful branches in the hippocampus? And I'm sure you can see that the branches in the isolated environment are sparser than in the brain cell from the animals in an enriched environment. Why is that interesting or important? Well, I banded off that trillions of brain cell connections. If you're going to make, as brain cells do, 100,000 connections, it's going to be determined by the surface area of the brain cell. The greater the surface area, the more connections can come in. And here they are. That's how you have more surface area. You have more branches. The more branches a brain cell has, the more connections it can make. I repeat, the more branches a brain cell has, the more connections it can make. In turn, those branches, the growth of those branches, is driven by interaction with the enriched environment. So let's trace that. An enriched environment causes the growth, drives the growth of those branches, which in turn enables brain cells to form a target to a greater number of connections. So you can see the link between an enriched environment and more connections. So that we can apply to ourselves. This lovely Swedish lithograph of the ages of man or indeed of woman. Uh, let's just see how we can apply that idea not only to developing a mind, but to losing it as well. All in terms of brain connections. Well, here you can see the embryo, the fetus, the early postnatal, and the mature human brain. Let's stop there for a moment. You can see the blobby bit, and then see the branches. It's the branches that have changed enabling the brain, as it grows, to make more connections. But now look what's happened, sadly, over here to the right. The um, branches have atrophied. And in this case, but it's not a natural consequence of aging, you're looking at a brain cell from someone who is senescent and then senile. Recapitulating childhood. So we can think of branches reflecting the individualization, if you like, the personalization of the mind. The more branches you have, the more connections you make. And I would say that understanding is seeing one thing in terms of something else. That's why we see a significance. For example, you're born in the words of the great William James into a, a booming, buzzing confusion. As a kid, as a baby, as an infant, you'll evaluate the world because you can't do anything else in terms of raw sensations. How sweet, how fast, how cold, how bright. But gradually, those sensations are going to coalesce together. They've always occurred together into, let's say, a face, a face that speaks, a face that then requires a label, mum, and a mum that features again and again and again in your life. And we've just seen what happens when something features again and again and again in your life. We've seen the piano players, we've seen the taxi driver. <coughs> so mum, your mum, no one else's mum, your particular mum featuring day after day is going to drive lots of connections. Your mum has a significance to you that she has to no one else. Okay? or my mum to you, vice versa. So you personalise your brain. Now imagine it's all residing in those connections forged by the exposure to mum, the constellation of the patterns. Now sadly imagine if those connections were starting to get dismantled. You'd no longer recognise mum. And that's exactly what happens, sadly, in dementia. Literally a loss of mind. And anyone, and there may well be, given the number of people in the room, people whose lives have been ravaged by this terrible disease, which is the disease I work on, as you've just heard, um, we know that people say it's like they go back to childhood. It's not a mere loss of memory. It's a confusion, a disorientation, um, a joy at simple things, rather like a small child, because you're going back into a sensual world away from a cognitive one. Whereas one could say, arguably, as we grow, as we develop as adults, we, the shift goes from sensory, raw sensations through to cognitive, through to understanding, through to significance through to meaning, away from raw experiences and sensations. If your brain is dismantled, you go back the other way. Away from meaning, away from significance, back to raw sensation, back to experiences. And because you cannot understand it, you're often frightened. Like a small child, this time, someone came in draped in a sheet, they might think it was a ghost. I don't think many people would think that here. I don't. Yeah, so, uh, so um, because we have the checks and balances of the adult mind, we're small children. My little brother used to think they were with dragons under our bath in Chiswick, you know? And we're telling him that there are no such things as dragons, this is all in Chiswick. But it didn't make any sense. He just, he just was convinced because he lacked the experience and the wisdom and so on to be able to, uh, to confront the fear. 